Did you see the stylish? Welcome to the Young IPA Podcast. I'm James. This is Pete. Hello, everyone. It is the 15th of June. This is episode 171, yep. and we are talking to one of the very good friends of the Young IPA Podcast today. What, like, genuinely one of my favorite intellectuals mm-hmm. in the entire world. Love talking to him. Brendan O'Neill, back on the show. Hopefully by now... Everyone's had a chance to read Brendan's essay in The Australian that appeared over the weekend. Yep. We're going to go pretty heavy into that with him. So if you haven't read it yet, maybe pause the podcast, give it a read, then go back into it. Don't pause it. Uh, we covered it in the interview. No, because then you're not going to be able to commit to either. It's like you're going to be reading something at the same time just listening to words and it's just it's all going to be too much. Focus. Sensory, sensory overload. So pause, read it, come back here because we're going to be talking all about the move to remove statues all over the world. There's some Antifa stuff as well that we talked to him mm. about uh, what's going down in the New York Times, which is something we haven't had the chance to discuss on this show, but has fascinated me. We go for about half an hour with him. It's a really cool chat and can't wait for you guys to listen to it. I really appreciated Brendan coming on. It was 10.15 a.m. on Sunday morning in the UK, which mm-hmm. you know is pretty early on a Sunday morning, so thank you very much, Brendan. I was just quite thinking then when you talked about Brendan, was, is he the IPA, Young IPA podcast greatest friend? We don't, we don't want to pick uh, External? Probably has had the most appearances, I would mm. say. Yeah. Uh, Dad would be up there. Okay. I can't really think of who else. Michael Gregory's still rejecting interview offers. Oh, so, yeah. uh, <laughs> that, w- that was my dad for the, the people. Yeah, James is dead. Just um, to be specific. Yeah. All right. Uh, shall we talk? Because we've got a fresh new load of restriction easing that we should probably talk about. Yes, exactly right, which is good. Uh, new South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian said uh, they're going to scrap the limit of 50 people at indoor venues in New South Wales. Uh, such as pubs, restaurants and churches on July 1. And from today, there is no limits on funerals, which is great because I feel like that was the thing, you know, that really upset people the most was sort of 10 people at a funeral and telling people they couldn't go to funerals and things like that. So that is great that people in New South Wales can now have uh, big funerals. Um, What else have I got here? Oh, okay. So New South Wales will be able to return to sporting events in July. The government agreed to have uh, outdoor cultural and music and sporting events uh, at places with a capacity of 40,000 people, uh, up to 25% of that capacity. So that covers, obviously, most NRL games. <laughs> no, nah, just kidding. We love the NRL. The Freedom League. I don't. I don't. Sorry, I don't. I like it politically. Like, I don't like rugby league, but I love... Yeah, the Flanders guy seems mm. to be the guy you want on your side when yeah. the chips are down, but uh, if only he was managing over a better sport. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, better than the Swamp FL. Mm. Just thought of that there. Not bad. Uh, Froffies without food in Victoria. Yeah, you, you just didn't commit to that. I, I did not <laughs> like that. I was not going to give that. What, Swamp not FL. speaking was giving it what it deserved. I'm going to try and say Swamp FL as much as possible for, between now and when I die. Um, okay, so in Victoria, James, frothies without food, mm. which is good. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Andrews said up to 50 people would be allowed inside pubs, clubs, caf, not clubs, sorry, pubs, cafes, cinemas, and theaters from next Monday. Don't have to buy dinner to get a jar, which is good. I feel like the tight restriction on people in pubs only 20 people, uh, encourages people to get drunk because if you drive, have a pot, have a couple of wedges, you know, you feel like the struggling hospitality industry really needs a few booze hounds in there to mm. up the coffers. So the higher number is good for people not being alcoholics and just yeah. having one or two. Well, it's definitely good news for my waistline that I don't have to order a chicken parmigiana. And yes, I said have to order a chicken parmigiana yeah. <laughs> instead of a salad. But yeah, uh, yeah it's still Victoria being... One step behind all the other states. Yeah. Like we're just catching up to New South Wales and all the other states are leaving us behind. Just stubborn. So it's one of those things where you read it, you go, oh, great, this this thing is good. And then you've got to think about it for another five seconds and go, hang on, why wasn't this the case before? Mm. And why can't we still catch up to all these other states? And I want to bring people, like, this is why we talk about easing restrictions so stringently is because uh, Headspace, the uh, organization that talks a lot about mental health and depression. Young Australians are worried the coronavirus pandemic has damaged their future prospects. One in two saying their mental health has gotten worse since the outbreak started. Uh, and the impact the virus has had on 15 to 25 year olds and from a mental health perspective is really, really serious. Mm. So we're not just doing it because Pete and I want to go to a pub, which we do, but mm. it's not the reason we, we talk about restrictions being eased. It's because young people are getting out of the job market. A lot of them might not come back for a very long time. And that is losing a generation if it's not done quickly. That's right. And it's not like some people, I mean, most people, it's not going to kill them to have not have a job for a few months. Most people can bounce back from some something like that, but some people can't. Yeah. And they fall off the edge forever and they, they get caught in the, you know, with the drug abuse, alcohol abuse, homelessness track. Uh, and sometimes the only reason keeping them out of that is 
is a casual job. So yeah. um, whilst it is for most people, they can bounce back. Some people can't. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's why we're doing it. It's not to protect GDP and it's not because yeah. I want to, you know, in the immortal words of Patton Oswald, I don't want, like, it's not because I want to go to Fuddruckers. It's because people are suffering out there and we need to help them get back. I mean, yeah. once it's safe in the community, which other states it is, it should be safe in Victoria. Anyway, uh, we'll move on to statues chat because... Oh. So I just wanted to quickly run through borders. Go ahead. So we've been, we bade uh, Queensland leader Anastasia Palaszczuk um, about not saying that they probably wouldn't open borders until September, but she said they have a clear intention to uh, open borders on July 10. South Australia will open its borders on July 20, Tasmania late July uh, WA haven't announced anything read borders yet. They're using the protests as an excuse to keep them closed. Mm-hmm. Uh, news- if West Coast and Frio continue to drop games that yes. they shouldn't, that will change. That would, like, that's a joke, but it's actually, but it's 100% actually true. 100% true. <laughs> the, uh, uh, if, all Adam Simpson has to say is, oh, you know, playing Gold Coast is killing us, and he'll be under heaps of pressure. The <laughs> yeah. WA Premier NT will probably be July 20, but haven't announced yet. So there you go. Just yeah, to that. and, and that's another one. Like, once that's back up, I mean, I've got a friend of mine who works at a restaurant that really depends on international clients and now that that's dried up they're really hoping for domestic clients but if borders don't open soon then the restaurant's gone mm. and that's something he's put a lot of work into over the last couple of years so it's the, it's these kind of stories that is the reason we talk about borders the reason we talk about jobs exactly exactly right all right uh statues a lot to talk about still the number one issue in the world mm. uh, again we've left behind <laughs> uh George Floyd completely. We've yeah. left behind police brutality completely because it's all about which statues deserve pride of place and which do not. Now, I don't say this lightly, Pete, okay. but Uh-oh. I don't say this lightly. These these words do not come easy to me. Okay. But do, David Shoebridge, the Greens MP, might be a stupid person <laughs> because that's all I can take away from what he's been up to this week. So David Shoebridge yeah. went to a Black Lives Matter rally, right? He goes to one. Yeah. And then 48 hours later... He travelled almost 500 kilometres to the Nambica State Forest to join a local Indigenous community for an anti-logging rally. Mm. How stupid do you have to be? Well, as Warren Mundine said, you know, this is a massive issue if it gets into Indigenous communities, which thankfully so far it hasn't. Yes. But if it does, it would be very bad. If it goes into that community, there is one guy I'm going to be looking at pretty closely. Mm. Like that, I mean, how reckless are you with people's health that do not have the same access to uh, health facilities that you do how reckless do you have to be to go to that rally? Well, and especially when your whole thing is, oh, you know, Black Lives Matter, we've got to, you know, I care so much about Indigenous people, we have to address the issue of Indigenous incarceration and deaths in custody and then you uh, didn't think through the thing you did two days later. Yeah. Uh, massive inconsistency. Now, the reason I bring up Shoebridge in regards to statues is because when Captain <laughs> Cook's uh, statue got... Uh, tagged, I guess, last week. Yeah. It's come out that the person who did it was a uh, part-time green staffer, uh, part-time green staffer for David Shoebridge. So he's not exactly uh, selling himself as the person to win over Middle Australia to the to the Greens' cause. I would say. No, I wouldn't have thought that at all, James. But he did say something which really tickled me. This is what I was laughing about before. Before he said, so the person who got arrested, as you just mentioned, was part-time employee. He said. Uh, statement, uh, they were engaged in employment at the time of the incident. Sorry, they were not engaged in employment at the time of the incident, which occurred well outside of work hours. <laughs> David, oh, okay. <laughs> David Shubridge saying, hey, guys, context matters. Yeah. You know, as like we ripped down statues of, you know, people who did stuff 400 years ago mm. and people get sacked, as I'll mention later, for stuff their wife puts on Instagram. Yes. And we cancel people for tweets 15 years ago. That's on workouts, mate. Yeah. So, you know. Hey, once it hits 5.30, they're no longer ambassadors for their employer. <laughs> what a private individual does in their own time is none of our business. Yes. So, uh, just the actual, the massive hypocrisy just made me laugh so hard. It's fantastic. Uh, over in the UK, we have reached statue singularity because last week on the show, we laughed around on Friday that if we are to abide by the rules of cancel culture and if everyone is going to be held to the same standard, then there's a lot of people that were heroes to not, you know, we're heroes on the left, not saying they're not heroes to the right as well, but mm. heroes to the left that would have to go. And in the UK, in Leicester to be specific, over 6,000 people have signed a petition to remove a statue of Gandhi. Mm-hmm. Now you think about how lauded Gandhi has been for 70 years, but mm. now 29, uh, 2020, no longer cool. That's exactly right. They said he was a fascist, racist, and sexual predator. And they've uh, put together a petition which more than 6,000 people have signed. Uh, and there is a protest of the local community, many of them with Indian background, to symbolically protect the statue. Um, 
yeah, but pretty incredible that someone like Gandhi, like obviously uh, there's probably a few things about Gandhi which aren't. I would say I've heard, uh, well, I've re- I didn't hear them, but I read things he said about black people that uh, would get you cancelled in society within mm. five seconds and rightly so. Like he was not a fan. Yeah. And this is the thing, whereas every single figure in history, like every single person alive, there is good and there is bad. Yeah. And statues aren't supposed to be this like all encompassing we support everything they ever did ever that's exactly right and i think this goes to a thing about the ahistorical nature of a lot of these protests like a lot of people don't seem to know about history yeah. <laughs> but they're very dead set on we have to rip down these statues like we saw in ballarat during the week uh howard and abbott's statues got defaced because they've got the thing the walk of prime ministers in lovely ballarat which dr bella de made a video about, about for the ipa uh yet all the prime ministers of the people uh, Prime Minister before 1966 when the Menzies government abolished the white Australia policy as John Roskam I'm stealing this talking point from John Roskam in his IPA email uh, all the Prime Ministers who supported the white Australia policy were not defaced so it's like you people obviously don't know your history Keating managed to escape def- despite introducing mandatory detention of refugees which is a massive issue for the left so uh, yeah no exactly you're right James yeah and then we talk about with Brandon in the interview coming up in a Black Lives Matter rally desecrated a yes. monument dedicated to black soldiers who fought for the Union against the Confederates. Yeah. Like, I can't think of a more ahistorical yeah. way to su- show your support for Black Lives Matter. Risk their lives fighting slavery and yep. they, their monument got destroyed. Yeah, out of control. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about with uh, statues is there is now... Labor in the UK is supporting the government's, uh, like the Conservative government's motion to introduce prison sentences of up to 10 years for those who desecrate war memorials, uh, which is, you know, pretty heavy fine. And Brendan mm. talks about like who are the people that are going to be enforcing these laws and who are the people that are going to be pushing back the mob. And this sort of seems to be a way that the government can quell things. Maybe it's like a deterrent factor. Like I don't think anyone's going to be given like a full 10 years for their first yeah. stint, but maybe you go, okay, I'm not going to bring down that statue because the punishment's going to be a bit more severe. But the problem for me, and again, this is another thing we talk about, Brendan, I don't want to go over it too much. Making it illegal doesn't change the fact that 13% of Britons, according to a YouGov poll released over the weekend, approved of the way that the Colston statue in Bristol was taken down. Like they proved in the manner, 13%. You can have a 10 year jail sentence. You can stop people doing it. But the fact that 13% of people like what I saw on the weekend was A-OK speaks to something a bit deeper that can't be put away by a prison sentence. Is that an introduced law or it's being put through the... Uh, Labor said they're uh, supporting it. So I think it's like still needs to go through, but yeah. Yeah, see, I tend to agree with you. I feel like it's kind of like this Band-Aid sort of gesture Mm. rather than addressing the underlying cause, which is, of course, as we talk about with Brendan, uh, the university sector where people learn as absolute fact that, you know, the West is an oppressive, racist place. Um, So, you know, politicians... I feel like this is just a bit of window dressing rather than sort of, you know, really coming at the true cause of what it yeah. is, which is which is heaps of hard work and will take decades to overturn. So yeah. and, I'm and with you on like, that. that. That's with you. If you went through the university system only hearing about the negative aspects of Britain's past, and, you know, I'm not saying there aren't negative aspects, mm. but if you only hear about the negative sides, once you come out, of course you'd be like, why is that statue there? Yeah. Like, who are these people? Yeah. They should go down. No, exactly right. Uh, now, should we get on to Churchill and Google? Yes. So, Ch- oh, Do you want to take this? or Talk, talk to me. All speak. right. Well, Churchill and Google have had a run-in over the weekend. Uh, over the weekend, if you... Didn't go- work out for the last guy, all right, Google? I'd be worried. Yeah. Take on Churchill at your peril. Over the weekend, if you Googled UK Prime Ministers, the picture of Churchill was blacked out, um, and it also didn't feature Churchill's first stint of Prime Minister in the list of years that the Prime Ministers were in power, which was during World War II. It, there were some other mistakes in it, so that's probably not uh, a huge issue. I mean, it's like an issue that is wrong, but um, it's not a huge issue in what we're talking about. Now, this obviously led to accusations from people that they were um, blacking out his picture as part of the Black Lives Matters movement. Google have responded saying, we apologize for any concern. This was not purposeful and will be resolved. Images in such panels are automatically created and updated. During an update, they can briefly disappear. Uh, And then it went on to say that the reason why it disappeared was because a few months ago, people had actually complained that the picture they used at Churchill was really old and it was when he was um, young, which it was, uh, and that they had wanted... I thought it was like, it's an old picture of Churchill. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, no, what's the new one? It was, uh, it was a picture of him as a younger man than when he, when he became really famous. And um, so they were 
they were giving that picture bad reviews, which created a, uh, which created the Google system to give it a new image, but there was some bug in the system, which meant there was no image. Extremely convenient. Do you buy this, James? Uh, no, because like, well, you know, I don't have the smoking gun on me, but it was super sus. Because that would rate really well if you did. It would really, <laughs> and I've got the evidence right here. Yeah. No, but like, it was super sus because Rita Panahi, friend of the show, all these other people on Twitter were tweeting out what happened when they Googled people similar to Churchill. Uh, I think Rita had the wine that was like, she just Googled World War II leaders mm. and Churchill was blacked out. But you know who stayed? Hitler and Stalin. Now, yeah. you want to talk about people that were a bit colonial, a bit genocidal. Yeah. I would say Hitler and Stalin are two of the 20th century's most egregious examples. So if you're going to start blacking out people that you think are fascist and think are colonial, mm. would have started with those two. Mm. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So, but do you buy that it was... Uh, uh, well, again, I don't have a smoking gun, but it's extremely convenient that this happens a week after Churchill's statue gets was a racist on it. The problem with trying to believe Google is that they have been caught Such on bad form. They've been caught on camera saying they're going <laughs> to yeah. manipulate the twenty twenty US presidential election. Yes, so it's not like it's beyond them. No. I don't think the fact that they apologized or whatever makes me think that maybe if it. If it wasn't just a genuine mistake, it might have not been like the position of top brass. Maybe a mm. junior employee was like, I'm going to make my own little Black Lives Matter yeah, just, just, just protest and be brave stand and yes. fix all the problems of the world by blacking out this evil character, Churchill. And I reckon uh, the reason they've reversed it so quickly is because old people in Britain don't have a whole lot to do right now with the lockdowns <laughs> yeah. and they've seen someone come from Winston Churchill. And if there's one person... <laughs> Yeah, that you don't want to mess around with to keep those people at bay. It is Winston Churchill. Exactly right. So, uh, that, right. so that was what we, that was a big story over the weekend. Cool. So we'll now go to heroes and villains. This is a grunt the pig freedom snort, which I believe is playing right now. <laughs> This is a snort that we give out to people that have stood up for freedom and for liberty around the world. Stood up for good things, and we want to acknowledge them with the freedom snort. So, Pete. Mm. Well, I want to acknowledge Keen Hussey with the Freedom Snort, James, and I don't think it's the first Freedom Snort he's got, actually. No, no, Keen Hussey Research Fellow here at the IPA. Yeah, that's, yeah. I just assumed that everyone would know Keen they uh, should. as a household name. Maybe one day they will. Mm. Read those economic updates. Uh, almost. So what happened was it's been announced today that almost $72 billion in major infrastructure projects across the country will be fast-tracked. Uh, as an agreement struck between federal, state, and territory governments uh, that would slash approval times. That was like a Zoom call when it gets delayed. And <laughs> like, it's sort of like uh, let out when you squeeze like part of a balloon that's yeah. filled with water. And just the water just starts spurting out yeah. just straight afterwards. Everyone started whacking their computer because they're like, ah, bloody Wi Fi. <laughs> now, that was just me losing my spot. Um, so, uh, now the thing was, this comes because there's been a review into the Commonwealth Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act which is expected to recommend cutting green tape and that's going to be announced today. Um, and they said red tape approval times could be half to an average of 21 months, which still feels like a long time. Um, anyway, but this is the very act that Kean was talking about when he said that green tape has increased at the Commonwealth level. He's used reg data to show that green tape had increased by 445% since 2000. Interesting story, James. On Friday night when I was on Hardgrave... Oh, both plug. Check it out. Plug. Uh, both Facebook Bob and Bishop. Page, IPF Facebook page. Go yeah. check out Pete. Am I on there? Am I? Uh, you will be by the time people hear this, unless they hear it like immediately that it goes out. Okay. So shout out to those hardcore fans. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brom and Bishop and Barry Hargra uh, Gary Hargrave, who were both in Parliament at that time, said they're ashamed of voting for that. Uh, so the voting for that bill. So, you know, just speaking truth to power, James, mm. or truth telling, as they say now. That was that was quite the shameless plug. There was no part of that that needed Peter Gregory to be on the hard grave <laughs> yes. to tell that story. Yes, it, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to what we're talking about. Red tape approval times. The politicians who elected them are... Um, no, that was cheeky. Ashamed. That was cheeky, and I want you to admit it was cheeky. Uh, well, I don't... Look, I wanted to make a point about truth telling. All right. Truth telling is a stupid word. Yes. It's what they say now instead of speaking truth to power. Mm. But what it implies is that every other time you're talking, you're lying. If you have to announce that you're truth telling, you're lying the rest of the time. Mm. Now I'm in honest mode. Yes. <laughs> the people out there don't know There's some I mean. mental gymnastics going on <laughs> in my head. Uh, I'm going to move on to my hero of the week, Go. unless you've got more uh, plugs you want to make. Just impact. That's impact, isn't and it? And peter.j.gregory.7 yeah, on yeah. Instagram. I, I didn't agent. No, I'm... The, the impact though, isn't it? Yes, it's yeah. impact. Uh, right. So my one might be a bit controversial, but 
Dave Chappelle released, uh, I've been waiting for this for a while, but Dave Chappelle released his new sort of special 824. 826. 826, 846. my bad. 846. Uh, we got there eventually, but 846, new Dave Chappelle special recorded somewhere in Ohio. It was like, uh, I think it's basically the first stand up gig since coronavirus lockdowns happened in the US. Mm-hmm. Uh, wouldn't be everyone's cup of tea, but look, I love Dave Chappelle. I've said it on the show a bunch of times. I always find him extremely thought-provoking, extremely interesting. It makes you come at things from a different direction. What well, is not everyone's cup of tea, this special. I found it really good. Dad's article today did not care for some of the language that was being used. Really? Uh, but look, oh. it's not the funniest 27 minutes in the world. Obviously, these are not times that are that uh, quick to cause laughter. Watch it. Uh, I'd say a lot of what's going on in the world right now is a product of people only listening to their side on issues. Like everyone's just got the blinkers on. This is my side. This is their side. So I encourage everyone, like get out and listen to as many different viewpoints as you can right now. Dave Chappelle's, that's thought provoking. It will stick with you for a while. So did this, what was your dad's, your dad's take on it? Uh, some of the stuff said about Candace Owens was a bit uh, non-PC from Netflix, which also canceled Chris Lilly over in the UK, which is a good point. But I would say that neither should be cancelled. Was that his only grievance? Uh, that was the only mention that got in the column. I haven't okay. discussed it with Dad. Okay, I thought I had a bit of a scoop, like a big, big schism in the Bolt family. No, well, it, bad news for people that think I get all my talking points from my dad five minutes before the podcast airs. But I did really enjoy watching them. Okay, and I encourage you to watch it as well. There you go. All right, villains. Villains. All right. So now we give this to. Uh, so the villains. What we do is. Uh, anyone who's been a villain this week, we give them the fake uh, Extinction Rebellion fake nudie run villain of the week. More than 300 arrests have been made across Australia as Extinction Rebellion protests enter their sixth day. James, who's your villain this week? All right, sweet. Uh, my villain, this came I, from Seb Costello's Twitter. Seb Costello, not the villain. But check this out. Seb Costello tweeted, last night a restaurateur in Melbourne's north had Victoria Police come in and do a head count of customers. He had 21 people in. 20 is the limit in Victoria. He had 21 people in and was threatened with a $9,000 fine. Now, a week ago, only three fines were handed out at Melbourne's Black Lives Matter protest, despite tens of thousands, uh, 10,000 people turning up. You've, lo- you've lost all credibility to hand out fines, and now we're cracking down on the guy that's got one extra in his restaurant. I find that absolutely amazing. I, like, I just assumed they would stop fighting people. Mm. So what has this guy said? Is he like, I'm not going to pay or? Uh, he's keeping a pretty low profile on it. We yeah. don't even know what restaurant it was. Uh, under, like we know some stuff about him, but uh, you know, he's from, like, he's from a migrant background. So to think that this is just some far right, like, you know, guys like, you know what, if Black Lives Matter gets to protest, I get to open my restaurant. Not the case, but Look, you can't be handing out a fine to that guy for having one person over the limit when you leave all those protesters go. Well, this is the problem they've created them for themselves because if he says, I don't want to pay it, and then the government says you have to pay it, yeah, obviously it's created now, you know, it's just created this situation where people, because the government can't say, all right, don't have to pay it because that just creates a situation where everyone's going to break all the rules all the time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. They did this. Right. By the way, the cop that comes in, does a hate count, finds 21 and threat- threatens a $9,000 fine. He must, like, whoever that cop must Come is, on, must have been so gutted they weren't allowed to find protesters the other weekend. He would yeah. have got so ready for it. He would have sat there all day just going, oh, I want to find him. What did Goes you- home and puts his Lego pieces too close together so he can hand out fines to them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't he just go, just go, uh, oh, yeah, 20. Thanks, mate. See you next week. You Got know. it. It's just the rule is twenty. All right, uh, your villain, Pete. Oh, sorry, I thought that I'd done mine, but I haven't. No, Th- thank God you're here, James. All right, this is why I'm here. It's just Pete's <laughs> Pete's guide through yeah. his own podcast. He's very helpful. So my villain is LA Galaxy, which is a soccer club in the United States, uh, actually where David Beckham played. So mm. for those who don't know much about soccer, everyone knows who Beckham is, but he played there for a while. I think everyone knows what LA is as well. Yeah, just. You know, throwing that out there. Soccer team in LA. Things that that people know about. All right, I'll get on with it then. Yeah. Alexander Katai was released from Los Angeles Galaxy because his wife, I think it's Tia Katai, uh, who made Instagram posts comparing police brutality protesters to cattle, called for violent action against them, shoot the profanity, and captioned an image of a supposed looter carrying off a pair of sneakers with black Nikes matter. So... uh, I mean, that bit about looting is a fair point, but the rest of it's pretty bad. Um, so, you know, pretty horrendous Insta post from the missus. Now, the Galaxy made... So so the wife took down the post, right? 
And then Mr. Katai, Alexander, uh, issued a personal apology in which he rebuked his wife's insensitivity. Okay, so he's, he's, he's throwing the missus under the bus in public and he's still got the sack. That's out of control. He's still got the sack. LA, LA Galaxy President Chris Klein stated the decision was not a difficult one. Uh, so, you know, for all those people that are like Black Lives Matters, I'm sure they're also feminists. They're effectively sacking a bloke for not keeping his wife in check. Um, so well done. Uh, and if we're like, if we're sacking people for stuff like their wives do and their family members do, that is, that's a new level. Like yeah. that's tweets from 10 years ago people get sacked for. That's pretty bad. But stuff that people aren't even you do mm. that you apologize for and go through the whole public humil- humiliation thing and they still give you the sack. Where are we? My other question to you, Pete, is, uh, look, I've never played soccer that much. Okay. I think uh, my last time I played soccer was probably year eight, mm-hmm. and I scored three seconds into a game. Yeah. True story. <laughs> I haven't thought about that for 10 years until it popped in my head right now. And you gave me a spiel about shameless plugs. <laughs> <laughs> are you scoring hey, soccer? It's a shameless plug half hour, right? This is a shameless plug t- uh, show. But my question to you is someone that does play a fair bit of soccer. You spend a yeah. lot of time around soccer. Now, does your wife's or like significant others' yeah. uh, racist Instagram posts affect yeah. your ability to cross a ball? Nah, not at all. Interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's. I mean, can you imagine like all the NRL players sitting down with their wives, going, you know, no more anti-vaxxer tweets, yeah, right? Because that's next. <laughs> yeah, out of control. But, all right. but like, what we need. This is the serious point of this. Is like these organisations, powerful sporting clubs, powerful sporting bodies, Netflix and all that. Just stop being cowards. Mm. Just stand up to just. Stand up to it for five seconds and they'll go away. Yeah, like I'm sitting here in Melbourne. I had no idea his wife posted any of that stuff until mm. you sacked him. Yeah. It, it was a big fan on the flame. Uh, all right, that is it for the start of the show. Uh, let's now go to our interview with Brendan O'Neill talking about his Australian essay. So uh, we'll go there now. Okay, we now welcome back onto the show one of the great friends of the Young IPA podcast, Brendan O'Neill, editor of Spikes. Brendan, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, guys. Uh, so, in Britain, there have been what the BBC have been calling peaceful protests, but uh, we reckon that's not really the case. So, what have you been seeing going on? Yeah, we've had some crazy protests here over the past couple of weeks. We've had uh, statues torn down, statues vandalised, statues covered in spray paint. Uh, Winston Churchill has been sprayed with the word racist. Queen Victoria has kind of been sexually assaulted with spray paint in Leeds, very strange forms of graffiti on Queen Victoria. Uh, Lots of strange events. And uh, firstly, the protests are not peaceful. That's very clear. There's been lots of fights with the police and lots of vandalism of public property. Um, But also, I think they've been hysterical. I think this is a form of almost mass psychosis, where what we have are all these Um, You know, very often middle-class white youths, if you look at the photographs of the people who rolled the statue of the slave trader into a river in Bristol, they were all white men, um, but good white men because, you know, they're well-educated and middle-class and they think Britain is a horrible racist country. So therefore, in the eyes of the media, they're good white people. Um, And it's been a form of hysteria, just this lashing out against history, this lashing out against the past, this almost Taliban-like attack on icons and monuments that cause offense and it's it's i've found it incredibly creepy very odd and and the and the wide-eyed hysteria in some of these statue smashers eyes i have found um actually quite scary at times brendan um, i just want to ask you a quick question about that because we saw uh, i think overnight or over the last couple of days British people come out and defend the statue of Churchill and also uh, the statue of Baden Powell. Um, they were described as far right in various parts of the media in Australia. Is that accurate? And have you seen much of just ordinary British people sort of really having a visceral reaction to this kind of stuff and coming out onto the streets to defend the monuments that they that they actually quite like? Well, I, there's definitely been some far right people on the streets um, in London uh, this weekend. There was a protest to defend statues, ostensibly to defend statues. There were lots of good, decent people on those protests, including former soldiers and, you know, ordinary, largely working class people who wanted to defend the statues in Westminster in particular. But there was definitely a contingent of far right hooligans, complete idiots, people shouting racist abuse at black people, 
people shouting racist abuse at, at black police officers, you know, pretty horrific stuff, actually. And they completely destroyed the whole protest. And there was a kind of mini riot. So, you know, there's idiots on every protest. But I think across the country, there is discomfort with the attacks on statues. So an opinion poll has just found that 25% of Britons support the ripping down of statues. Now, in my mind, that's a high figure and I'm quite surprised mm. by it, but it is absolutely, uh, definitely a minority. I think most people are looking at the events of the past couple of weeks and thinking, what is going on? What does this have to do with George Floyd? What, the, what does this have to do with the issue of police overreach or police brutality, which are very serious issues? Anyone who believes in liberty does not want the police to be armed to the teeth and harassing citizens, far less kneeling on their necks and killing them. So there are serious issues that were, were really worth discussing. But in the UK context, and to a certain extent in the American context too, this um, the righteous anger over the killing of George Floyd has morphed into almost a, a new cultural revolution where you have all these young people waging war on the past, waging war on statues and waging war on offensive culture. You know, we've seen Little Britain, The League of Gentlemen, Chris Lilly's TV shows all being taken down from Netflix or the BBC. Um, there are now campaigns to remove a statue of Gandhi in the UK. There are campaigns to rename anything that is named after um, former liberal prime ministers who were judged to be a bit too far right. And it's, it's gone completely out of control. It clearly has nothing to do what, with what happened in Minneapolis. And really, it's just the continuation of the woke mob's attack on history, reason and liberty. Yeah, because that's uh, the next question we had for you, because uh, when when this all started, I thought there was some really productive uh, talks about what happened to George Floyd, the need to bring back, bring down police brutality, uh, end qualified immunity and ending chokehold groups for police in the US. But now the US, the debates mean, uh, moved over to defund the police and Britain, it's every statue needs to go down. So I was going to ask, is this just sort of uh, a, a good protest gone awry or is George Floyd and that kind of anger just now being uh, swallowed up by forces that were bigger than that and been around for a lot longer? Yeah, I think it's the latter. I think I think some people are exploiting the death of George Floyd to push forward political agendas that they always held in the first place, um, which I think is a pretty unforgivable thing to do, in my view. Um, I've always, uh, you know, I, I think everyone should be concerned about police brutality, right? You know, we want the police to to keep peace, to solve crimes and to keep people safe. We don't want them to attack people. Uh, we don't want them to shoot people. We don't want them to use tasers all the time unless absolutely necessary. So in the US, there is definitely a problem with that. It's th There's not much of a problem in the UK as it happens. We don't have armed police apart from at, at airports. Um, the police in this country don't really attack people. Uh, all, the, all the people trying to compare Britain to America in relation to police brutality and racism, I, I'm afraid to say they're just lying. They're just making things up. In the UK, a white man arrested by the police is more likely to die in custody than a black man. And no one will tell you these things because they need to maintain the narrative that Britain is a racist country and it's just no longer true. Um, my view is that no one should die in police custody and if they do, that you know, serious questions have to be answered about why that happened. But I think, you know, I've always had a problem actually with the Black Lives Matter campaign because I don't see it as being in keeping with those brilliant campaigns of the past, particularly the slavery abolitionist campaigns featuring liberal heroes like Frederick Douglass or the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, um, which were very much about expanding opportunity, autonomy and equality for black people. Those were incredibly important movements that propelled humanity forward. I think the problem with Black Lives Matter it, is that it is a fundamentally identitarian movement. It thinks myopically in terms of race. It sees black people as permanent victims, victims of history, victims of circumstance, just people who are put upon all the time and don't really have the autonomy to take control of their lives. And it depicts white people as being all, all of us complicit 
in racism, you know, and, and it presents whiteness as this kind of original sin. If you're born white, you're a bad person and you must um, uh, constantly do penance for the crimes of your ancestors. So over the past couple of weeks, we've seen actual footage of white people in America on their knees begging for forgiveness for the crimes of history. We've had the Archbishop of Canterbury saying that white Christians must repent for their prejudicial sins. We have even had Nigella Lawson, who is like the high priestess of British uh, domestic culture, um, saying that all white people are complicit in racism. So, so this is now a f the Black Lives Matter view, which I think is quite a misanthropic view, has become completely mainstream. This idea that the races are completely different. Blacks are constant victims. Whites are fundamentally quite evil, even if they don't realize it. It completely grates against the thing that we actually need, which is solidarity across races, across classes, uh, in the name of creating a better, freer, wealthier society. So I don't like any movement that divides people. And I think Black Lives Matter does that. You mentioned before that 25% uh, of British people support the pulling down of statues and, and you said that you felt like that was a high number. I felt like that, that was a high number as well. I thought it would be like literally less than 2 or 3%. Um, has it surprised and I guess obviously concerned you how much currency these ideas have amongst regular people? Because I always sort of thought of them as on the fringe crazy ideas that didn't have much currency. But over the last couple of weeks, just speaking with my friends and family who are ordinary people not that engaged in politics it's really really widespread how much of them how many of them just are like yeah structural australia is structurally racist you know things like that so has it does that surprise you and does that concern you i guess it concerns me enormously uh, the, the mainstreaming of these backward ideas as i view them concerns me an enormous amount because uh, I, and I understand why it's happening, because I think there is a, an unbelievable pressure to subscribe to these ideas. Uh, you know, John Stuart Mill talked about how the pressure to conform, the, the tyranny of custom, was often an even more authoritarian force than state pressure. And I think we've really seen that over the past couple of weeks. The, the pressure to conform to this worldview is intense. Uh, and you really, you know, the speed with which virtually every institution and corporation in the West has just capitulated to this agenda is staggering. You know, I've mentioned the Church of England. There's also the, the whole of corporate America has capitulated to this agenda and talked about white supremacy and so on, which in my view doesn't exist apart from in the minds of a few idiots somewhere in America. Um, you know, and uh, politicians are everywhere we look, politicians are taking the knee, bowing down. We've seen police officers taking the knee. Uh, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, he responded to the toppling of the statue in Bristol. He responded to that by setting up a commission to review every statue, street and monument in London to make sure that none of them had any associations with slavery or racism. So we have the institutionalization of the kind of Maoist approach. And, and so the capit and, and we know that universities have capi capitulated long ago, and this is where many of these ideas come from in the first place, because history teaching in universities is now largely concerned with saying that the West is evil and horrible and everything in our society is built on, on racism, slavery and colonialism, which is just not true. So um, the capitulation is staggering and so few people are willing to stand up and say, hold on, not all white people are racist. Not every problem faced by black or marginalized communities is a consequence of racism. There are other bigger complex discussions to be had and a serious adult society should have those discussions. So few people are willing to say that. I understand why, because if you say that, you'll be called racist, people will try to cancel you, people will try to get you banned, and that has happened over the past week. We've seen people tweeting perfectly rational, normal criticisms of what's going on, and instantly a mob of people are reporting them to their employers, trying to get them sacked. The, the conformism is, is amazing. I'm re I was really struck by one of the placards that you see on every demonstration now, which says, silence equals violence. And I was thinking about that slogan, and it doesn't actually mean you have a responsibility to speak up about injustice. I actually think people do have a responsibility to speak up about injustice. It doesn't mean that. It means if you don't say what we expect you to say, then you're a bad person, you're a violent person. 
By silence, it means people who are refusing to repeat the mantra of these kinds of identitarian movements. So that's the level we've reached. We've reached a level where if you just sit back and say, I don't agree with what's going on and I'm going to raise some criticisms, you will be called racist, you'll be called a bigot, you'll be de depicted as a violent person. And somehow we have to challenge that conformism because I think it's going to be really dangerous. And it so strikes me as well that uh, George W. Bush got in such hot water for saying, if you're not with us, you're against us in the regards to the war on terror. And now, like, apparently this is the new war on terror. Uh, yeah. My take with statues is if you, like, if you feel statues overly represent dead white men, which obviously they do, I don't know why the solution isn't to build more statues. Uh, I, I, like, I, I know some statues, you're not exactly going to be able to move Trafalgar Square or Nelson's Column or anything, but I don't know why... We need to remove old statues rather than just uh, have more statues around, embrace every part of your history, embrace female leaders, embrace people from different uh, ethnic backgrounds and have as many statues to represent as Britain and Australia's and America's true histories. Absolutely. You know, I, I actually think there's an important public debate to be had about who gets memorialized, how it happens, who makes these decisions. I think there should be, you know, broad public consultations about this. But what we've seen in the UK and also in the US is just um, mob behavior. It's just small groups of people who arrogantly presume that they have the right to redecorate the public square to make it more suitable to their tastes and their beliefs. And, that, and that's completely unacceptable. I mean, some of the behavior in America has been completely deranged in my view you know a statue of columbus was beheaded um another statue of columbus was dragged down set on fire uh people were people were invited to come and kick it in the head and then it was thrown in a lake and that kind of stuff really does bring to mind the behavior of of, of the taliban or isis when they were hacking at the heads of religious monuments that they considered to be offensive it's just it's unusual uh, unjustifiable behavior and, and and massive mistakes have been made. One of my favorite uh, monuments in America is on Boston Common. It's a monument to the black contingent who went to fight in the Civil War on the side of Lincoln against the South. And um, there was a special contingent of soldiers who were all black and who wanted to do their part in this war to end slavery. It's a fantastic monument. As you enter Boston Common, it has pride of place in Boston. It got uh, vandalized. It got vandalized by uh, with Black Lives Matter graffiti by people who obviously don't know their history, don't know that there are memorials out there that celebrate the enormous contributions of um, non-white people, ethnic minorities, women, that those statues are out there. And because society has changed, and ethnic minorities and women now play a larger part in public life than they did 50, 60, 70 years ago, the future statues presumably will commemorate lots of those people. So um, I, I just think this, but I think the reason they're attacking old statues and ripping them down is because they don't actually have anything positive to say about the present or the future. They don't, even, they don't have good ideas for how society should look or how problems should be resolved. So they lash out against the past. They lash out against anyone from history who had questionable views. And it's a very backward looking uh, political campaign rather than the kind of future orientated stuff we need right now. You've talked about something that we haven't actually mentioned on the show yet, uh, and that is the coup underway at the New York Times. A opinion editor James Bennett was forced into resignation after he let US Senator Tom Cotton write an op-ed arguing there should be a military presence at the riots if the police weren't able to control the crowd. Now, that view is held by a lot of Americans, in fact, uh, probably a majority of Americans. Uh, the newsroom said this made the New York Times unsafe. Why is it such a big deal? that it's the New York Times and what is about this particular incident that it makes it more important than other stuff? I think it's a huge deal what's happened at the New York Times. I think it's one of the most important things that's, that's happened over the past week or so because really it's, it's a woke coup. That's what we've seen at the New York Times. We have seen a coup against the old guard by the newer, younger, more woke sections of uh, the New York Times staff. I think it's really important. And, uh, you know, the New York Times, I have got, a list of criticisms of the New York Times as long as my arm. I could go on all day about the New York Times and all the problems, particularly in recent years. It's not been a fantastic paper. I mean, I'm a passionate supporter of Brexit and the stuff that the New York Times has published about Brexit has just been unhinged and 
when I meet kind of hip liberal New Yorkers, uh, when I go to New York, they, they always think Brexit Britain is this complete hellhole because they've been led astray by the New York Times. So I've got loads and loads of criticisms of the New York Times, but the role it played in American life was really important. It was a key liberal institution. It was a defense of American liberalism, American liberal values, um, freedom, openness, uh, you know, it played an important part in lots of those uh, arguments and lots and sometimes even in struggles in relation to uh, standing up for the freedom to publish, standing up for the right to uh, publish critical commentary. You know, the New York Times was key to all of that. So it was incredibly important as a liberal institution. The fact that it now can sweep aside its opinion editor, which is one of the most important jobs on a newspaper, because there was a virtual walkout by people uh, offended by the Tom Cotton piece really demonstrates that it's now been captured by a new younger guard which is not liberal, which does not subscribe to those values of openness and freedom and publishing all the news that's fit to print, which was the New York Times slogan. It doesn't subscribe to those values and instead it wants the New York Times to narrowly reflect its own, the views of the woke mob rather than the views of American liberalism more broadly. So there's an incredibly important generational shift taking place from you know, a left that was largely liberal uh, in the West towards one that is incredibly illiberal, unforgiving, censorious, occasionally remorseless, and often thinks nothing of destroying someone's career if they say the wrong thing, if they have the wrong attitude or if they publish the wrong kind of opinion piece. So that to me is quite worrying. And the language they used, I thought was fascinating when they say it made them feel unsafe. This is the, what we're seeing is the spread of the safe space mentality from campuses into everyday life. And that's the real lesson I've taken from the events of the past couple of weeks. You know, campuses have been full of this kind of nonsense for years. The safe space idea, the idea that you can inhabit a bubble and never be offended, never come across something you disagree with, never have your self-esteem or your ideas challenged. You know, we've created a generation which arrogantly thinks it can glide through life without ever encountering a sore idea or a difficult idea or a controversial idea. And lo and behold, as these people move into media and politics, they're bringing that narcissistic authoritarianism with them. And that's what's happened at the New York Times. The New York Times has now become a safe space. And a newspaper or a campus or the public square, these places should never be safe spaces in terms of ideas. And, and th the shift in that direction, I think, is really worrying. What I couldn't believe about the New York Times one was those writers that said uh, this op-ed by Tom Cotton makes black New York Times writers unsafe, makes us an unsafe place to work. What I couldn't believe is if you genuinely thought that, how do you not quit? Like, if I genuinely thought the IPA was putting out work that made Australians unsafe, I would not work at the IPA. But, so what I, like, and you hit it there, I just think this is a newsroom of people that know from experience through university, from experience in other parts of life, if you throw enough of a sulk and if you say enough slanderous words about people in charge, they will bow down to you and you will get yeah. what you want because no one wants to be dragged through the mud online anymore. I, I, I completely agree. And, and that's the thing that has to change. I, I, you know, I go on a lot about the woke mob and all these irritating young people and everyone accuses me of just being a grouchy old man and everything. But, um, but on the other, the flip side is that I don't think it's entirely their fault. You know, they've been inculcated with rubbish ideas and a kind of, you know, a, a self-reflective desire to constantly defend yourself against controversy. They've had that kind of pumped into them for a long time. The real problem is the institutions and the individuals who capitulate to this. So I think um, the way in which Netflix and the BBC have behaved is just beyond disgraceful. You know, it's so cowardly to remove um, Little Britain, the League of Gentlemen. Uh, UK TV has taken down one of the episodes of Faulty Towers because it's anti-German and it contains lots of uses of the N-word. This is just incredible institutional cowardice. And every single act of cowardice emboldens people who think they have the right to censor. That's the problem. There is a, there's an intimate symbiotic relationship between the cowardice of institutions and then the, the swagger 
off the censorious mob. They, the censorious mob lives off that cowardice. You know, Netflix and the BBC should have stood up and said, no, we are not removing anything because we believe in artistic freedom. And we believe artists have the right to say things that are shocking and offensive and whatever else. Um, you know, and that's the real problem we face is, is, is this constant capitulation. So if you look at, for example, the case of J.K. Rowling, J.K. Rowling is, is currently at the, end, at, the, at the eye of a Twitter storm because she is skeptical of certain views to do with transgenderism. Um, she is very pro-trans. She is on, on the side of, she has trans friends and she thinks trans rights are incredibly important, but she's skeptical of erasing women's spaces. Um, she puts her views across incredibly rationally, incredibly reasonably, and she has just been denounced constantly for weeks on end. But the difference with her is that firstly she's too big to cancel because she is like a, a British institution um, but also she actually has stood up and she hasn't apologized and she hasn't capitulated and she wrote a long long essay this week really well written saying look this is why I hold these views please read this and maybe you'll understand that is the way to approach these issues the way to approach these issues is not to become hateful yourself and to respond to the mob by becoming a mob and nor is it to capitulate and say okay i'm sorry i will never say it again it's to stand up for the right to speak the right to offend the right to hold difficult ideas and the right of everyone else to hear those ideas freely and unless we defend freedom of thought and freedom of speech then the mob style behavior we've seen over the past few weeks is going to get worse and worse Brendan, let's talk solutions for a sec because you've sort of mentioned and it's something we talk about on the podcast a lot is that uh, all these ideas start at universities and millions of kids leave university every year knowing for a fact that the West is racist, that capitalism is oppression, that liberalism is, a, is an idea of white supremacism. So clearly the main game is the universities. How do we get, uh, and it's no surprise that this has happened, so how do we get liberal and let alone conservative ideas back on university campuses what 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 is the solution to that well that that that's the million dollar question and it's such a difficult question to answer because um universities have gone so dramatically downhill um i i i really i genuinely don't know the answer to that question i think it part of it however has to be the willingness of institutions to a refusal of institutions to capitulate to the demands of small groups of people. Um, I've seen flashes of universities doing that. A few universities in the US have issued statements in defense of freedom of speech. Um, I thought that the um, vice chancellor of, of Oxford University responded very well this uh, a few days ago to the demands to take down the statue of Cecil Rhodes, uh, the old British colonialist. and. Um, she said, look, history is full of difficult figures, difficult characters, and it's better to have that out in the open rather than tearing everything down. So uh, who knows how, whole, how long these people will hold the line for, but that kind of thing is very important because I think what that does, it sends a signal to the large numbers of people at university who actually hold rational, reasoned, liberal views, but who rarely express them because they know they'll be hounded and de demonized and shot down. It sends a signal to those people that it, they can have a bit more confidence and start to speak up. And I think that's really the only way to do it. You know, I was due to speak at Oxford in 2015 on, on the abortion issue and um, a, a group of students, it was me versus another male journalist. Uh, I was giving the a pro-choice argument and he was giving a pro-life argument and it was going to be a very reasoned, civilized debate. And a group of feminists at Oxford um, decided it shouldn't go ahead because we're men and we can't talk about this issue and um, they threatened to turn up and cause a fuss and make sure the event couldn't take place and I was to be honest looking forward to having those kinds of arguments and that kind of conflict and I thought it would make for an interesting event but Oxford University itself capitulated to these students and called the event off and that, that to me was, that was quite a useful turning point for me because it made me realize that the problem is not necessarily, you know, upper middle class, blue haired idiots who think they have the right never to hear difficult ideas. It's institutions themselves 
who 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 capitulate. And for Oxford, the you know the old one of the oldest universities in the world, the highest seat of learning on earth for a very long time, the fact that even that institution has sometimes given into these people is a really worrying sign. So I think the only way to get universities back on track is to do it internally, is for people to have the confidence, and is for people to start building up networks so that if they are subjected to a Twitter storm or a witch hunt, um, they will have a, a group of people who will defend them. That's the only way to do it. In the UK, the government here over the past couple of years has tried to do it by bringing in new laws which will make it illegal for universities to ban people, which is which actually doesn't work because what you're trying to do is tackle authoritarianism with authoritarianism and that creates even more tension and it leads to people effectively being banned because they are pro-censorship. It's very surreal. The only way it can be done is in the institutions themselves through confidence, uh, giving space to more voices and absolutely refusing to sack anyone just because of their point of view. Yeah, like uh, the government law seems to be putting a band-aid on a gaping wound. I mean, it doesn't matter if they can or they can't. If the intention is there and they, the desire is there, that's way more disturbing. Uh, one thing I want to ask you about, which isn't in your essay, is Chaz, which is the newest country in the world, the uh, six blocks of Seattle that uh, Antifa demonstrators have gotten off for themselves, uh, might now be under the rule of a warlord. Uh, but on surface, this looks like people overthrowing their oppressor class and staging a communist revolution and they're running it as a collective. You're someone that's uh, been involved with Marxism in your past and uh, is this the uprising that the world has finally been waiting for? <laughs> Absolutely not. I've heard people comparing uh, it comparing it to the Paris Commune, which makes me want to throttle them. You know, there, there have been uh, incredibly important, in my view, there have been very important revolutionary moments in history. Um, which have transformed all of our lives for the better. This is not one of them. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is a bunch of um, overeducated bourgeois pricks, if I may say that, who are just <laughs> taking over some streets and, you know, having a bit of fun. It's pathetic. And I noticed that there's a no, there's a no, there's a smoking zone because, you know, of course they want, they adhere to all the, Kind of PC prejudices of our time. In fact, these are not radicals at all. And there's a there's a place in this um, supposed commune where you can smoke, and in most other places you can't smoke. Which just sums it up. Sums up the kind of petty bourgeois upper middle class views that most of these people hold. And if of I course, can jump in, sorry, if I can jump in, in that smoking zone, are you allowed to start fires, or is it just cigarette smoke? <laughs> I, th I think it's just cigarettes. Oh, and there it's, we go. Um, it's like. The, 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 the thing about it, the thing I think is is really uh, bizarre, is that it's it is the ease with with which they've done it. Now, I am not a big fan of police bullying tactics. Um, I don't think anyone should really be arrested unless they do something violent or damage property and so on. Um, I absolutely don't think people should be arrested for what they say or what they believe. And I think community independence is quite important and all those things. But the fact that these people have been able to set up this kind of zone, which actually has a sign saying you are now leaving the United States. As you come into their zone, it says you're now leaving the United States and entering our free world, which I think is written in crayon, which kind of sums it up. But the fact they've been able to do this speaks to the real problem of our time, which is, I think, an absence of authority. Now, I don't mean physical brute authority, but I mean moral authority, political authority. You know, this goes for Britain too. Britain at the moment, and I say this re with regret because I was very enthusiastic about the vote for Boris Johnson in December, particularly the millions of votes he got from the red wall seats, which used to be Labour seats for decades, because it spoke to an incredibly important shift in this country. But Britain at the moment feels like a country in limbo. There's, there's no leadership. There's people, I, I don't know who's running this country. You know, the pandemic and then the riots and the economic crash we're heading towards, all of these things have, have pushed Britain into this incredibly strange period where we don't really know which institutions are in charge. We don't know if the police are capable of policing. We, we haven't really heard that much from Boris in terms of moral leadership in, in a confusing time. It's like a ship without a captain at the moment. And I think 
other countries feel similarly. America is slightly different because Trump is such a huge, colossal, controversial, strange figure. But I think a lot of countries right now feel like, who's steering this ship? Who's in charge? Who's, who's, who's morally on top? And who is capable of coming out and saying, look, you must not tear down statues. You must not riot in the streets. This is when lockdown is going to end. This is how the economy is going to be repaired. There's no one making those kinds of statements. So I think across the West, there's a crisis of authority. And into the vacuum, we are seeing all these movements coming, these kind of neo-Maoist movements, the Seattle experiment, the people taking down statues. I think they're exploiting a vacuum at the heart of our societies. And the question that we should really be talking about is how do we fill that vacuum to hold the mobs at bay and to give society at large a real sense of direction? I think that's the challenge we face right now. Definitely a conversation for another day. Brendan O'Neill, editor of Spike. Check out his essay in The Weekend Australian. It was absolutely perfect. Always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brendan. Always awesome to talk to Brendan O'Neill. That was absolutely no exception. Love could have gone for four hours. Could have done the full Joe Rogan Experience podcast on that one. Let's do it. Uh, we could, why not? All right, uh, we'll talk to Steve. All right, but uh, before that chat, let's get through some stories that made us laugh this week. Now, last week we talked about Chaz, the world's newest country. Chaz, Pete still loves that name. It's not a person. <laughs> It's not a vote called Chaz. Uh, so Chaz is the free area of Seattle that Black Lives Matter protesters have gotten off for themselves. It's now a wall up. Uh, so apparently we're back on walls oh, so to okay signify now. boundaries. But uh, interesting to me, memes met reality this week at Chaz, like, okay. and, which by the way, might be controlled by a warlord. But anyway, memes met reality in Chaz this week. That's a crucial there point. there was an actual dumpster fire. Yeah, think okay. about Chaz being a dumpster fire because it might be run by a warlord and they don't have food. But there actually was a dumpster fire. A dumpster caught fire in Chaz. And who do they call this collective citizens bargaining? We're leaving the USA. We're starting our own place. Mm. Who did they call? The Seattle Fire Department. I don't know if that's that. Was it, it deliberately lit? I I wasn't there. Okay. I'm <laughs> just trying to work out is it part of a riot or was it just... was it? Uh, Probably not the point, look, is it? Yeah, it's the, the point, point is it's a dumpster fire and it's a meme, but also it's Chaz and it's analogy that's also there. It's just a perfect storm. Yeah, and I get, so you're not allowed to, at first I thought, oh, well, you're not allowed to do that. This is meant to be your own country. You know, everything's going to be perfect. You're not allowed to call on the great capitalist overlords. But then I was like, well, you know, we got help from the US during the bushfires. Maybe this is the same thing. But I don't think you're allowed to go to your direct enemies and get help, mm. are you? I don't know. I don't know what the rules. I mean, I don't know what the rules are. But well, we go. should get King Jong Un on the phone. Yeah, to like see we, what they've done in the past and yeah. see if there's any wiggle room. Yeah, exactly. And so, my my view on Chaz has softened a little bit. I think. Are you? The thing I have to ask is: Do the people who are living there want to be in that separate country? I saw they they, they want to be in that. Oh, tough. I know like, there's people in there now that were like, "I want to move to Chaz." Yeah. But I don't know if they did a stock take of literally every single person that lived in that six era, six block area. Yeah, because if most people want to stay with the US, mm. then I'm against it. But if most people or, or like a big majority of people want to leave, it's like I'd let Scotland go if they want to go. Let them go. I was, I was favouring Brexit. Scotland is the same as Chaz. Peter Gregory, <laughs> 2020. Don't write in. I've got Scottish blood on me. In me. In me. I've got Scottish blood <laughs> on you. I love my heart. But no, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, look, you know what? My thing on autonomous countries and autonomous zones is if they want to leave, let them leave. But I assume that, you know, this guy is actually a warlord and it's violent and terrible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, get your jokes out about Chaz now because I don't think this ends well. Oh, okay. Like, uh, you know, the history of cults in America is not great. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, okay. You're probably right. Yeah. But uh, until then... Uh, I'm going to make Raz jokes and there was a dumpster fire and that was funny. Yeah, and I did enough qualifications to not get held to account for that in the future. <laughs> All right, now let's There's move. one thing we know about cancel culture is they take the whole clip into context. Well, I mean, it was outside work hours, wasn't it? So <laughs> don't worry about it. Julia Baird is a historian and host of The Drum, which never has the IPA on, um, which, you know, is, is um, I don't I mean, do we care about that? I guess so. Oh, it'd be nice to be invited onto the national broadcaster to promote a view that a majority of Australians hold. Yeah, I suppose if I didn't have to pay tax for it, I wouldn't care, but I do. Okay, anyway, let's get into it because she wrote in the Sydney Morning Herald, 
over the weekend. The image I made of this is too small. Now I can't read it. But Would you like me to help out? No, nah, it's all right. Now I can read it. June, in June, like a couple of days ago, 2020, she wrote, the toppling of statues is enriching, not erasing history, and it has thrilled my heart. So this is from a historian. That doesn't feel like a very disp- uh, dispassionate view. Anyway, back in 2017, she wrote an article in the very same publication, James, which was with had the headline: "Statues help us glimpse, help us glimpse into our past, even the ugly bits." So the keen-eyed listener would realise that they are diametrically opposed views, and that's okay. You can change your mind, but that's not what this is. That's, this is not her going. I previously wrote this, and that's wrong because of X, Y, Z. It's just her saying that it's fine to kill statues because some people in the past were bad. Um, and I don't know if she remembered the previous article. Yeah, I'm not too big on shaming journalists for changing their minds on things. I think mm. it's healthy, mm. um, unless it's really funny, like Jennifer Rubin or this one with Julia Baird. What's Jennifer Rubin? She used to be full on George H. W. Bush is the greatest guy. Sorry, George W. Bush is the greatest president, and now it's full on the resistance, uh, which is fun. Yeah. And then stuff like this, but you know, I'm not. I'm not totally into mind change shaming. I don't, but I don't think. No, she remembers her previous one. Have you read the article? I've read the second one. I read the second one. Oh, yeah. yeah. But she didn't say, I previously had this view. Oh, ah, well, interesting. That's, what my point, yeah. that's my point. Well, maybe... Uh, uh, I, I tried to think of a joke, but uh, it didn't, I ran the calculations and it didn't work. So I'm going to stay silent with that one. <laughs> just right. to explain that bit of dead air. No, nah, because at the same time, I don't think you should get shamed for changing your mind at all. I think there should be more... Well, not more of it, but we sh- you know, people should feel free to change their views as the evidence changes. But I don't know if that's what happened here. All right. So... There you go. And also, from the point of view, she's actually a historian. And a historian that says, you know, it's fine to um, bring down statues feels a bit... Uh, it's a bit weird. Well, it gets that 13%. You can make it a law change, but it's not going to change the facts. Anyway, my last one that I want to talk about. So, last Friday on the show, we talked about the NASCAR race, or was it just a car race, or anyway, a speedway that uh, said it was a protest, which was why it could shirk coronavirus... Uh, distancing restrictions Mm -hmm. it's moved on to argentina and i really like this one so an evangelical church in argentina has reopened as a bar in protest against lockdown on religious services that remain in place bar tables were placed inside the church pastors dressed up as waiters carrying bibles on their trays in a mock service as part of call for religious services to be allowed during argentina's coronavirus lockdown now i'm a drama kid so what i like uh, about this one that i like which it makes it better than the Speedway is the use of props and costume changes. I really like that. I like the fact that people are dressed up as waiters. So these people have a whole lot of sympathy from me. Mm. And I wouldn't rule this out as a long-term plan. Like yeah. if you can convince enough people that aren't exactly on top of the ball that Sunday morning that it is actually a bar and they come in and learn about the word of God from you, that's a big win for your church. Yeah, it could be a real money, not money spinner, but it could get people through the door on mm. a regular basis. Soul spinner. A soul spinner. Is it they uh, were they yeah. serving booze though? Because that was the bit I was interested in, and I couldn't <laughs> quite work out if that was actually happening. I uh, just in hope that they. I, I think they stick to the bit. There's booze. They okay. have to reopen as a bar. And yeah. bar serve booze. Last well, time I checked. What an absolute man of God mm. this this pastor is. Uh, I am so surprised that in Argentina they don't have an opened. Like the very religious part of the world, Latin America. Yes. The fact that they've opened bars, but they're still keeping the laws on. Um, Churches, maybe it's an age group thing. Maybe lots of old people go to church. Yeah, I think you found out the reason why. <laughs> that right, was I, Peter Gregory live discovering. <laughs> like Julia Baird, I'm going to change my mind on that. Yes, and, and uh, not acknowledge it. All right, uh, last one from you, Pete. Yeah, well, an interesting piece of data. We bring all the big hard news to the people with uh, the Young IPA podcast. And an interesting piece of news came in over the last few days. Celebrities are trusted by just 8% of Australians. Actually, it came out last year, but it was on Twitter and everyone was getting around it this week celebrities are trusted by just eight percent of a tra- of australians doctors and nurses on the other hand top the list trusted mm. by 97 percent of us hopefully not jeanette young in queensland but anyway scientists were the second most uh, trusted group 93 percent um followed by police and law enforcement 84 percent uh so i mean i reckon these celebrities mate they have to get on the make a few more videos a few bit more imagine a bit more apologizing for being vile racists up until june 2020 mm. otherwise they're going to stay at eight percent what was the trust in? Like when they say trust <clears throat> celebrities, what was the trust? Because I re- I have 100% trust in celebrities to do stupid things, yeah. like make Imagine videos or say from now on, no more racist jokes. Yeah. Like I 
trust with all my heart their ability to do that way more than I trust doctors to be able to do that. I would, I would not trust a doctor to do something so stupid. So I think trust is an interesting concept. Here. That, that's a really good question, James. And maybe I should have re- uh, researched this a little bit more deeply because it just says trusted by 8% of Australians. But there would have been, like I didn't read the report. I read the article about mm. the report. If I read the report, it would obviously give out the methodology. So maybe that's something we can come back with on Friday. Uh, all right. So hit the books and yeah. we'll reassess this on Friday. Do better. There will be a test. All right. Uh, that do the work, is it for saying. the show this week. Thank you to Brendan O'Neill. I mean, awesome chat, awesome essay in Australian and Spiked is just the best. So yeah, uh, make sure you're leaving us a five-star review. Oh, we can't do that. So make sure you're leaving us a review. Assign as many stars as you wish Hmm. on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Tell your friends. We're also on Spotify, all these other podcast apps. Check out Viral Banter. Check out Looking Forward. They're also available wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. You can also listen to Viral Banter and to Looking Forward. What's the five-star thing? So I just don't think it's uh, polite or within oh. Apple's regulations to ask for a five-star review. So you know what? If you like this show, leave us a star review based on how well you feel about it. Yeah. Mm. That's interesting. Give it five seconds of thought. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. That is it. See you guys on Friday. Thanks, Friday Josh. Show. Friday show.